only time I've spoken to the Institute uh, about this project was over a decade ago when it first started. So I'm going to go back to the beginning. And back in the beginning, um, the Arts and Humanities Research Council, the Arts and Humanities Research Council launched a program of grants um, for research for community heritage. It was a slightly unusual scheme. It had three rounds. Um, the deadlines were all very tight. Um, and the first round, you were only allowed one application per institution. So we had to club together um, between various departments um, to put together something. Uh, and in that first round, we got grant money to run a short week-long course in post-excavation um, for the Welling Archaeological Society and other community heritage groups in Hertfordshire. And um, I'm sure recognise one or two faces who were helping teach that course. Second round, we can skip. The third round, you're only allowed to apply for if you've got money in the first round. Um, and this was for a jointly authored research project. Now, I've been um, doing little bits of geophysics ever since my undergraduate days. Uh, here I am um, collecting data for my undergraduate dissertation, uh, but also working with community groups. And what I realized is a lot of community groups wanted to do geophysics, generally could only afford an earth resistance meter, but of the various techniques that were available, earth resistance is a bit slow, varies according to the weather. If you split surveys over multiple days, it can be hard to stitch them together. So it wasn't ideal. Um, so my idea, which I then um, floated around the various other groups in the county, um, was perhaps what we could do is get a magnetometer and train a, a group of people across multiple societies to use that magnetometer. I knew that some groups already had a magnetometer and it spent 50 weeks a year underneath somebody's bed. Um, so it would be better if we could sort of spread the machine or use the machine over multiple groups. Um, and we got the money. Um, and this was uh, the groups that were involved um, early on. Um, and it, it was remarkably successful. So there were two parts to this original grant application. The first part was to run a week long course in geophysics for community archaeologists. Um, and I had been teaching geophysics with the National Park Service for a number of years. And so I um, got three of my friends who taught various techniques, <laughs> twisted their arms, paid their airfares and got them to come over and help me teach a, a week long course on geophysics for community archaeologists. Um, and then also a few people from here like Andy Bevan and Guy, <coughs> excuse me, Guy and so on. So we managed to do MAGSAS, GPR, magnetometry, earth resistance survey, um, the whole sort of range of techniques for a week. Um, we did this at Verulanium because the museum lent us a lecture room for nothing for the week. Um, and the afternoon practicals, you just walked out the door and you're in the middle of a Roman town. So ideal site uh, for teaching a course like this. Um, and here we are running all uh, some of the techniques, not the magnetometry, but some of the other techniques. Ralph here, um, <laughs> I, I, he, he had his own GPR and he turned up on the first day and said, did I mind if I bought his GPR along? I said, I'm sorry. Um, and Ralph had built his own motorized cart system. So it's actually got a, 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 an engine from a um, golf um, caddy and a control panel at the top. So he points it in the right direction, turns it on and just walks behind it and it drives itself across the site. Um, so it was a really successful course. Um, and uh, the mayor at the time, who's now the head of Hertfordshire County Council, uh, came along. I'm not entirely certain her high heels were ferrous metal free, um, let alone the tap that she has around her neck, but let's not worry about that too much. Um, so that was the beginning of the, the, the project. But the main part of the project, and one of the things that we were doing at the course, was learning how to use our new um, magnetometer. So we bought this Forster cart system. Uh, it works with uh, an odometer, so you don't need to walk to a metronome, unlike earlier systems. Um, it collects four lines of data at half meter intervals, uh, half meter transect spacing, um, and uh, seemed to be an ideal machine for what we were doing. 
Now, the project um, originally was intended to do magnetometry on Iron Age and Roman sites in Hertfordshire. Well, 10 years later, we've done 45 sites at least. Depends how you count sites, that's why I'm slightly vague. Um, and um, for those of you who are not sure, Hertfordshire is the little bit in here. So we've, we've extended slightly out um, from the county. Not only have we extended out from the county, but we also have extended uh, the range of machines that we are able to use, um, largely in thanks to uh, the Institute. So we had, we had a res meter, but we got a newer res meter, which is much fancier and much better. Uh, we have an earth resistance cart system. Um, for a number of years, we borrowed a ground penetrating radar from CIHA, um, Science and Education in Arts, Heritage and Archaeology, or whatever the acronym stands for. Um, but we now have our own system. Um, to start with, we were using uh, a total station that we had, but um, we then got a GPS, which made life um, uh, much easier. Um, and it turns out that we wore the original magnetometer out in the 10 years of survey. Um, so last summer, we managed to get a grant to um, buy a new magnetometer, uh, which has five sensors instead of four, but more importantly, has uh, a GPS attached to it, which means that uh, it makes the whole survey process much quicker. We're not restricted to surveying in grid squares anymore. Why are the volunteers involved? Well, I'm going to let them tell you themselves. File number as well. These are showing the echoes from the buried material, but it takes a lot of processing to really sort out what's happening underground. I was interested in archaeology as a student and even went on one dig in that era but then work got in the way and it wasn't until I retired that I joined a local society. In 2013 I joined up with the Institute of Archaeology team, now known as CAGG, which somebody else will explain, and went on a wonderful course which taught me all about the geophysics methods. At that time I realised that I could understand geophysics much better than probably the archaeology, so I decided I'd spend my time doing the geophysics. And that really is how I got into it. I've spent nearly 10 years, or is it more than 10 years, looking at buried amium. I got involved with it a completely different way to most people were. Uh, I was in this band <laughs> and, and we were having a uh, down the pub after a, a, a session and we were going through uh, bucket lists and my mother I always wanted to be on a dig or go for a dig and there was a lady there who said oh I live in Purton um, we've got a lot of going on at the moment come along next Saturday so basically I went along and met some 
Gill and Lorenzo Lewis and others and me just did a lot of work in Burton and then I got involved with other societies and working here so I, I, I've got no formal training or no formal uh, degree in any, any way shape or form I just uh, come along and help basically that's me Where we're recording the data. It's a standard tough book, good for outside, shouldn't get rain penetration, and it's touch screen. So what you can see on the, at the moment is all of the lines in this big field that we've already done, and you can zoom in and you can actually follow. If I move it around a little bit, you might be able to see me moving it. as we move it and then we can actually start recording and as I record it's filling in the bit of the, the screen that I've just done it's not in the right angle but then it saves the track the idea is that we go up and down keep the lines as close as possible and we're filling in this, this part of the field at the moment. I first got interested in archaeology through history and my first history lesson that we had at secondary school was about Stonehenge and about Brochs and uh, Cranogs and the like and I, I never forgot it carried on in science because that's what my the technical background was um, but I kept up with bits of history archaeology over the years and started watching Time Team and seeing geophysics. I joined the Welland Archaeology Society when I actually moved to Welland Garden City and a couple of years later I had the opportunity to join the what turned into the Community Archaeology Geophysics Group, CAG and went on the one week training course. Uh, by then I, I started studying up at um, Cambridge and I've studied at Cambridge and Oxford part time to sort of fill in the gaps and really understand what's going on. And doing the geophysics with, that, with this team and during that week really gave me the grounding and the confidence to actually go ahead and sort of cross train into a totally new area. So I'd like to thank Ken for putting that together for me.
Right. So obviously, as well as actually collecting the data, um, there's been a fair amount of having to disseminate the results. And that's been in a variety of forms, obviously traditional academic papers, um, but also um, newsletter items for national societies and local societies and popular magazines. Um, and uh, quite a few um, lectures at various venues. In fact, I, I was curious as to how many lectures on the project I've given, so I added them up this morning. Um, and this is the 77th time I've talked about this project, of which about 67% were to community archaeology groups. And some of the groups have had me back about three times to give them updates on the project as we've gone along. Um, and there's also the project blog, um, which has uh, well over 100,000 words uh, on the various surveys that we've done. We've had a few successes. Um, we were, didn't win the Marsh Award, but we were in the top three for the Marsh Award. Um, we also won the um, Provost's Award for Public Engagement. And an entertaining story about that, because as we were there, a group of us went to the, the evening, and one of the other people there asked one of the group members, um, what we were doing, and she explained what we were doing, and looked and said, "So, what's the community involvement?" It was like, "Well, I am the community. I'm not faculty." <laughs> it just assumed that the person he was talking to was a member of the faculty and not one of our volunteers. So, just a little bit about what I think is probably the biggest weakness of this project. So, we've got masses of support from UCL and the original grant from the Arts and Humanities Research Council. Um, I think this is probably the longest running one year project they've ever funded um, and CHAR, of course. And then we've got all these community groups. And as one of my um, volunteers described it, there is a single point of failure. Uh, and that single point of failure is me. Um, I worry that if I ever fall under a bus, um, that this project will cease to be. Um, so that is something that is uh, gives me the occasional sleepless night. Um, the other thing is that it does take a lot of time to write up the various reports that we need to generate, um, and I will freely admit there's a little bit of a backlog on those. One of the things that I hadn't expected when I started the group, um, you know, I thought that we would do projects that the group were interested in. I thought we would do projects that individual societies that are part of the group would be interested in. What I hadn't realized is that we would end up doing projects on a variety of other sites around the country in collaboration with different groups. So Urchester, for example, was run alongside um, a group up there which is excavating and Leicester University. Um, Dura Breva is one of our members, is very interested in it, but it's also run alongside um, Cambridge University and Stephen Upex. And the next phase next week um, is uh, sponsored by Historic England. One of our members had to move out of area and ended up near Flag Fen and volunteering there. So we did some work for them. Um, and then some bits of work for various members of staff down at Ashington, um, our training project last year, um, Chisbury for um, Andrew Reynolds and Stuart Brooks and so on. Um, so just to have a look at a couple of these. So Bygrave, up in the north of the county, was the site that we looked at last Thursday and Friday. So this is hot off the um, press, so to speak. Um, and this was a project which um, the historic environment record at um, Hertfordshire County Council asked us if we would do a little bit of survey work in this field. So we did some mag, we did some res, we did some uh, magnetic susceptibility survey. Um, some of the both masters and undergraduate students came out and helped. Some members of the HER were there and some members of our group. Um, and we got some quite nice results. So we picked up um, a ploughed out Bronze Age round barrow. We picked out uh, the Roman road, what we think is the Roman road running across the data. Um, I did put a res square over the round barrow and couldn't see anything in it. And then when I plotted it, I managed to fit it at exactly in the middle, <laughs> in the middle of the circle. Um, so that was a slight hiccup. Malden uh, was an interesting project down in Essex. This was a, a grant that two members of UCL staff had got um, for a community engagement project um, at this um, leper hospital on the edge of Malden. Um, but they were required to do some archaeological survey. Uh, so we went down with the ground penetrating radar because I thought that would be the most likely thing to pick up the walls of um, the leper hospital. 
Um, we did one day where we were just surveying, uh, and then the second day it was open up to the public, and um, uh, Joanna and Co um, had banners and posters and things, and we had lots of members of the public come and um, talk about the project and, and so on. Um, in the end, the results weren't all that exciting, apart from this mystery circle, which had me puzzled for a very long time. You know, how did we end up with such a perfect circle? Uh, until somebody found a postcard in the Malden um, archive uh, that shows a perfectly circular footpath <laughs> around the monument uh, in the 1960s, I think. Um, so sadly, not quite so exciting results from that project. Um, Dickett Mead is one which is close to my heart. Dickett Mead is the Roman villa on the edge of Wellin village. Um, and uh, the bathhouse from the um, villa is preserved in a vault under the motorway and you get to it down a tunnel. Um, this is the Frigidarium and this is a statue of the man who ran the excavation uh, and this is a statue of his wife. Um, and actually one of the excavators is up the other end of the bathhouse stoking the, 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 the fireplace. Now, we put together a project which was jointly between um, Wellin Hatfield Museum Service, um, the Wellin Archaeological Society uh, and CAG, Young Archaeologists Club, uh, and it was called What's Under Our Feet. And we managed to get a uh, museum service, I should say, managed to get a small grant from the lottery fund to pay for this. And what we did is we, we had a weekend with the, the, the young archaeologists where we did geophysical survey on the area outside the bathhouse, um, MAG and RES and GPR, um, and used the total station to lay in the grid. Um, and then a few weeks later, oh, there's the results, not very exciting. A few weeks later, we went back and dug some uh, test pits using um, Carenza Lewis's uh, recording system for one metre test pits. Um, as you can see, the, the uh, Enthusiasm was slightly varied, but uh, generally they were extremely um, keen on that. Um, and then we did a little bit of post X, they washed their finds, um, and they actually put together an exhibition on their finds or on some of the finds from the original excavation. And right at the end of the project, we had a party in the bathhouse. There's their ex um, exhibition in the background there. Um, literally the weekend before lockdown. <laughs> just got it under the under the wire not that we knew that at the time and perhaps the best archaeological cake uh, <laughs> I've, I've ever come across um so that was really good and some of the the, the yak members uh, seem to be quite keen on carrying on uh, in archaeology um sadly the the st albans yak has folded since then and Hart, one of hartfordshire's gaps at the moment is we have no young archaeologists club in the entire county uh which is a shame um, Hampton Gay, again, this was a project being run um, by a friend of mine from my college days uh, with the um, Oxford University um, Department of Continuing Education. Um, and at Hampton Gay, um, there were some uh, aerial photographs. This is a 1940s uh, RAF aerial photograph where you can see there's some quite nice um, round barrows showing. Um, and they've done a magnetometry survey over these round barrows, um, picked up the round barrows quite nicely, but also picked up the boundary ditches of a long barrow. And I was asked, did I think the GPR would um, give us any more detail about the long barrow than they were getting from the magnetometry? I was a little sceptical because generally GPR is not very good at ditches, but we'll give it a try. Um, and actually, we got extremely good results. This is just one um, time slice. Um, but once you stack all the time slices together, it actually gives you a reasonably good idea of, of the shape of the um, uh, quarry ditches either side of this long bar. And the fact that once you get down deep, they're clearly not a straightforward, simple um, ditch feature, that there are um, details in there. There are things I don't understand. So this clearly is the um, a double uh, ditched round barrow. What these long, thin features are, um, I have no idea. 
Uh, and I was very pleased when I got an email from one of the Historic England um, geophysicists uh, who said he'd seen them before and he has no idea either. So, <laughs> um, so um, I don't know what they are, probably animal burrows or something like that. Um, and Cholesbury, uh, the Beacons of the Past project, again, another big uh, lottery funded project run by the um, uh, Chilton's um, Area of Natural Beauty. And they um, paid for high resolution LIDAR, the entirety of the Chilterns. They set up a project where community archaeologists were going through the LIDAR, picking up features that weren't known before. But they also paid or enabled, in our case, for geophysical survey of some of the sites. And Cholesbury was an Iron Age hill fort. Um, and um, in one of those uh, slightly embarrassing coincidences, our original magnetometer had literally blown up um, and, and plugged it in and smoke started coming out of it. Um, and uh, the beacons of the past project paid for it to be repaired. And we did some of the survey with that machine. Uh, but before we finished the survey, we got the grant to get the new machine. So half of it's done with one, the old machine and half of it's done with the new machine. Um, and this image gives you some idea of how much more efficient the new machine is. So these two blocks and this little block here uh, took us two days to survey with our old machine. Uh, all the rest of the survey, um, north and east of the hedge line, was one day's work. Um, so it, it did speed things up greatly. And the nice thing was that we picked up some roundhouses uh, in the mag data. They're quite subtle, but they're quite clearly there. Um, some of the other features I don't understand. I don't know what these big horseshoe shaped features are. Some of these are clearly tree, um, uh, tree throws where something's blown down uh, in a gale. I did think that this was the 1930s excavation trench across the site. But when I georectified the site plan onto um, the map, uh, the, the 1930s trench is in a slightly different place, so that must be a, a, an old rusted away service of some sort. But our major project, as, as um, Andy alluded to at the beginning, has been at Verulanium. And this is the project that um, really is sort of my baby, if you like, in the sense that um, it's the site I wanted to survey. Uh, but I think the rest of the group have uh, bought into my enthusiasm uh, as we went along. Um, for those of you who don't know Verulanium, uh, its importance is that it's the biggest Roman town in Britannia, which doesn't have a modern town built on top of it. So London's the biggest town that has London built on top of it. Um, Sirencester is the second and Verulanium's the third. We've lost bits. Um, uh, there's the village here. Uh, I've never quite understood why they built the museum on top of the town basilica, but they did. Um, uh, but most of it is uh, open and half of it is under a public park and half of it is part of the Gormbury estate owned by uh, Lord Verulam. Um, so this is the survey we've done so far, uh, 1.07 square kilometres of magnetometry survey, um, starting off at the beginning in the park, then extending into Gorenbury, then outside the town walls, um, and then this year filling in a few bits um, around the edges of it. The GPR survey, um, we've mainly, we've done some of the park, but we've mainly concentrated um, in the Gornbury estate. Um, and this is taking a bit longer because, of course, each time we push the GPR backwards and forwards, we're only collecting a single line of data. So we have to work, walk four times the distance to cover the same area as we do with the magnetometer. Um, but we have, as of this summer, uh, finally finished uh, the entirety of the Gornbury side of the town, about 35 hectares of ground penetrating radar survey. Uh, and the Earth Resistance Survey, um, one of our problems is that we are usually surveying in August. And if any of you can remember back to last August, uh, everything was baked hard as concrete. Uh, and Resistance Survey involves sticking probes in the ground and having moisture, 
neither of which we had, so we did no survey at all last year. Um, but we got some, we have had some quite good results in previous um, seasons. Obviously, we're not the first people to work at Verilanium and not the first people associated with Institute of Archaeology. Um, the major um, uh, campaigns of excavation by Mortimer and Tessa Wheeler from 1930 to 1933, uh, and then Shepard Frere in the late 50s to the early um, 60s. So um, here's Frere uh, and Wheeler um, behind him. And of course, ironically, um, Frere dug in Wheeler boxes, but Wheeler didn't dig in Wheeler boxes because he hadn't invented them at that point. Um, so we know quite a lot about the town. Uh, we know quite a lot about the town in the park, uh, where Tessa Wheeler ran the excavations on the main buildings. We know quite a lot about a thin strip where um, Shepherd Frere was excavating along the line of a new road. Um, but there are also quite large areas of the town which we don't know uh, anything very much about. And that was our plan. We wanted to do a survey of as much of the town as we possibly could, as much of the suburbs as we possibly could, to fill in that plan. Of course, we weren't the first people to do um, magnetometry or, or geophysical survey at Verlanium. And in fact, one of the very early magnetometry surveys by Martin Aitken took place at Verlanium. And here's Martin along with um, Felicity Wild and Charles Hyam. And Charles now writes a column for Current World Archaeology, which um, uh, talked about the, the Verlanium project a few months ago. Um, so if we look at the plan of the town as a whole, this is what happens when somebody puts an 18-inch cast iron gas pipe through the middle of your Roman town. Um, that's about 30 metres across, though where we've got no magnetometry data at all. This is what happens when you dig a lake and dump all the soil <laughs> upslope over one edge of your Roman town. But you can see this line which goes round, which is the 1955 ditch. Now, the 1955 ditch was not dug in 1955. It was first sectioned in 1955. It's actually the um, boundary of the town, um, dated by Frere to roughly um, AD um, 80. Now, Frere only dug two little trenches, one roughly here, one roughly here. We don't know exactly where those trenches were, because when you look at the report, there are so many feet from the edge of the hedgerow, and um, the hedgerow doesn't exist anymore. Um, so that makes life a little bit difficult to work out exactly where they were. Um, but if we compare um, Aitken's survey of the corner of the 1955 ditch and our survey of the corner of the 1955 ditch, you can see, OK, it's much cruder, but there's a gap, there's a gap, you know, clearly the two um, uh, actually match really quite well. Um, Aitken was very keen on magnetometry because it's so fast. He collected three and a half thousand readings in two seasons. Um, I worked out that with our old magnetometer, we were collecting three and a half thousand readings about every eight or nine minutes. Um, but despite the higher data density, you can still see that those original results um, were valid and really quite good. Now, I'm often asked, why do we do all three different techniques? Uh, and the, the answer is simple, that each technique on its own doesn't show everything. And even all three together won't show everything. So if we look at this Earth Resistance Survey, we have a couple of very nice buildings showing up in the Earth Resistance Survey, a nice long corridor building. It actually has a wing coming this way, a little outsidal building there. If we look at the magnetometry data for exactly the same area, we can see here's our nice long corridor building that shows beautifully. But our little apsidal building is completely absent from the magnetometry data. So if you only collect magnetometry data, you're going to miss buildings. Um, it's really, you know, you, even if you collect all three techniques, you won't find everything. Um, but clearly, magnetometry does not pick up non-magnetic foundations all that well, unless the surrounding soil happens to be very magnetic, which is what's happening here. Now, you may wonder what's going on there. 
Well, that's the classic magnetometry signature of something that has burnt down. Um, and if we go back to our Earth resistance survey, you'll see that there's the end of a stone building, but not a huge amount of evidence of something else there. And I think what we're seeing there is a timber building which burnt down probably in the Antonine fire in the middle of the second century and was never rebuilt. And so all that burnt material wasn't um, disturbed. Now, of course, all of this um, is entertaining interpretation, um, but uh, to actually prove that as a burnt down building, we'd have to stick a trench in it. But that's my working theory um, at the moment. So some of the other things we found which have been quite fun, um, one of which was this thing called the sinuous ditch. Oh, well, that's what we called it to start with because we didn't know what it was. Um, and then we realized that if you compared it to the 19th century ordnance survey map, the sinuous ditch followed very closely the 300 foot contour. So there is only one reason to dig a ditch that follows a contour. This must be the town aqueduct. Uh, and we knew that there was a town aqueduct because people had spotted in the past um, crop marks of it going up the valley um, towards Redbourne. Uh, it possibly goes as far as Mark Yate. We don't know where the end of it is. Um, and in fact, if you just look on Google Earth, you can, if you go through the historical imagery, you can actually trace bits of the um, aqueduct there. What nobody knew is it doesn't show in crop marks closer to the town, and we didn't know where it went through the town. Um, so we, we have the course of that aqueduct um, there. What I don't know is, was the aqueduct cut by the later town wall? Well, is the town wall later, <laughs> first of all? And does it cut it, the aqueduct, or is there some sort of culvert or something underneath the town wall to let the water through? At the other end of the aqueduct, so the aqueduct is in here. You can't see it in the GPR data. As I said earlier, usually GPR is not very good at ditches. But we've got some quite solid looking floors. We've got some fairly solid looking buildings. And then we've got gaps where there ought to be walls. Um, and one of the things that you realize when you're working at Verulanium, if you turn around and look over to the abbey, that's where the town ended up. Um, the tower is made almost entirely of reused Roman brick. Um, the whole thing's made of flint. Um, where was the easiest place to get flint? But just to dig it out of the Roman town. And so all over the place, we find we, we get a road and then it sort of disappears with a big hole. And clearly they, 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 they've put in a trench, found the road and, and excavated it away. Now, this is upslope. There's about a 30 foot drop from here to the road. We know from 19th century excavations that there are drains that go across this field. Um, and just down here out of shot is the Roman theater. So we've got a big building at the end of an aqueduct, upslope from drains next to all the other public buildings in the town. It seems to me as though it's a good candidate for being the town's bathhouse. Um, again, we would need to put a trench in to actually prove that. And then we, we sort of save, save the most surprising stuff to last. So for the last two years, uh, we've been surveying this long, thin field called Black Grounds. Um, and we've had some quite nice um, results. Um, so this building shows very nicely in the GPR data, shows very nicely in the Earth resistance data, shows very nicely in the MAG data. And we could have saved ourselves a lot of time just by getting the Google Earth image and tracing <laughs> the, the, the parch mark off the ground. Um, so um, that's a fairly typical looking posh end Roman townhouse. Nothing very exciting about that. Well, fairly exciting, but um, we had a big blob here. And again, that one was quite interesting, to uh, easy to understand. Uh, because Shepherd Fair had excavated it in 1961. And that is the monumental gate that marked where um, Watling Street crossed the 1955 ditch. So the earlier town boundary, um, the one that was built in AD 80, um, this is where the main road uh, left the town. Um, and here's a couple of uh, photographs um, of the surviving 
um, stonework from the monumental arch. The bit that surprised us though, and I've turned north off to this side just to fit it on the screen, um, was this big building. And this came up this summer. Um, a big wing with a colonnade over the front, the river Ver is here looking over the river. Um, some more buildings, faint hints of buildings, partly robbed out in the background here, this long empty building. And the interesting thing is, is this is Watling Street. So for some reason, whatever this building is, has turned its back on the main road and is looking out across the river, uh, which suggests to me that this might be a private building rather than a public building. Um, there it is again, and there is the nave of St Albans Abbey at the same scale. Now, St Albans Abbey has the longest nave in Britain at 85 metres, and our building is 80 metres long. Um, so this is absolutely huge. So um, for publicity purposes, we're calling this the palace. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, whether it is a palace or not, and not that calling it a palace actually helps us very much in interpreting it, but it's clearly an extremely large building. Um, there are some um, surviving floors showing in the GPR data. Uh, there's a second corridor um, at the back. Um, and I sort of want there to be an entrance axis, but <laughs> there's a bit of a dog leg in that. What I don't know at the moment is whether things like the long, thin building in the middle of that are the same period as the big building at the front. My guess at date is that it doesn't appear to have burnt down, so it's probably post Antonine fire. And just along here is the back of the town wall. And it doesn't strike me that if you build a big building with a nice colonnade to look out across the river, that you would really want to look out at the back of the town wall. Now, if you believe Wheeler, the town wall was built round about 230. And if you believe Frere, the town wall was built round 270. So somewhere between the Antonine fire and whenever the town wall, wall was built in the third century is my best guess. Um, I have singly failed to find a parallel to this in a Roman town. Um, there are parallels I've come across um, that aren't in towns, like the um, Villa Eccles. This is actually longer than our building. This is 100 metres long. Um, and one of the things I thought was quite interesting, that's just the plan of it. One of the things I thought was quite interesting is when you look at these large villa sites uh, across the Western provinces, nearly all of them, or a lot of them, have some sort of water feature right in front of the main colonnade. And I wonder whether my building, that the water feature is the river, <laughs> that they've deliberately put it there overlooking the river to fulfill the function that some of these others are, is um, fulfilled by, the, um, by these um, ponds or um, pools, whatever you want to call them. And then moving down, um, we have another big complex of buildings here, which if I zoom into one bit of it, we have a building that looks remarkably like a basilica. Only we know where the town basilica is because they built the museum on top of it. Um, so we've got another basilica. We have two basilicas. And then in the middle of the courtyard next to that building, um, but deeper down, so in the GPR data, I'm having to look deeper, we've got some sort of very um, sturdy buttressed building, um, quite badly knocked around, but um, showing reasonably well um, in the GPR data. And then next to that, a courtyard with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine little buildings in the middle of it. Um, so up until now, up until this summer, we've done the survey and we found things big townhouses, small townhouses, temples, roads, aqueduct. You know, all things we could put a label on. Really nice to be able to fill in the plan, but all things that were not a big surprise if you're surveying a Roman town. The sweeter buildings we found this summer, I really don't know what they are. Um, and it's, it's going to be an interesting challenge to find out some parallels for those 
uh, and to come up with some sort of uh, interpretation of them. And then thankfully, something we recognize, um, a Romano Celtic temple down in the far end of that field. And it's actually a second one that doesn't survive so well underneath the hedgerow just here. But the thing I find interesting about this Romano Celtic temple is having had all these big buildings all jammed together, there's in nothing with a little temple in the middle. So they clearly kept the Temenos area around that temple um, clear. And we know from the earlier excavations that this sort of area um, was kept as a sort of gravel surface for quite some time before they um, built on it. So future plans, where are we going next? Well, we have a few um, definite surveys and a few possible surveys. Uh, next Tuesday and Wednesday, we're up at Dura Brevi, doing part of the suburbs of the town. Um, weekend after next, I'm at Clavering, um, looking at the castle there. Um, one of the things, now this is where I wish I had presented you. One of the things that does worry me slightly is that when we started 10 years ago, we had quite a big group. And over the 10 years, we have some really excellent core members. But some people have moved away. Some people have just lost interest, whatever. So the core group is slowly getting smaller. Um, so we need to do a little bit of recruitment to try and get some more um, members. Um, and Flamstead Church, um, stunning church. They've got a, a very big lottery grant. Um, its roof was full of Death Watch beetle and was about to fall on the congregation. So they had to <laughs> redo the roof. Um, they have contacted me about running a weekend, um, doing some geophysical survey in and around the churchyard. Less to actually find out anything particularly stunning. Um, we may or may not find dead bodies. Um, geophysics is particularly bad at finding dead bodies, um, but more as a, a, as a way of advertising the group and hopefully getting some new members. Um, Hartford Castle, uh, trying to get a big lottery grant, and again, we're hoping to do something with them next year um, in a similar sort of vein. Um, and I'm hoping um, if we can get the, um, the school to answer their emails, uh, to run something at Ticket Me during um, the CBA Festival of Archaeology. What about specifically in Verulanium? Well, there's all sorts of things I'd like to do in Verulanium. There's this bit we'd ever finished. Um, this bit up here where the Google Earth image shows all sorts of interesting things going on. Uh, and then Windridge Farm um, down here. Now, Windridge Farm, um, there are some quite good um, aerial images. So there's a Roman villa in there. And then a mysterious ditched enclosure, rectangular ditched enclosure shown quite nicely. Um, and there was a, a metal detecting rally a few years ago that plotted all the fines, and that's the distribution of the fines across Windridge Farm, um, some of which were lead slingshot. And um, there's a paper just published in Britannia suggesting that's maybe evidence of a, um, a battle um, just outside of St Albans. Uh, and then the, um, the authors would like it to be um, part of um, Caesar's campaign based on the, on the slingshot. What's worrying me about this little bit of landscape is that it's one of the areas which has been proposed um, for housing development under the local plan. Now, the local plan hasn't been accepted yet, um, so I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Uh, interestingly, the, the, the developers say there are no archaeological constraints in this area. Um, well, there's no legal archaeological constraints, I suppose. Another area I wanted to do was this one down here. Um, this was a school playing field where we found out that they were going planning to do some work. We need some archaeology doing. Um, so we volunteered to do the geophysical survey several times, never got an answer. Eventually discovered that they had a geophysical commercial survey done and they were doing some excavation. So I tried to find out what they'd found. And this was the reply I got from the commercial unit, um, which is a polite way of asking me to go away and stop bothering them, I think. So big gap in my survey, which is a little bit annoying. Um, other things, uh, this is one of our surveys. This is actually published in the um, uh, report on the um, excavations here by the British Museum. Um, we were thinking of putting in a, doing a 
our um, training dig up in that top corner. The problem with this bit doesn't take very long to do. That bit <laughs> takes forever to do. Um, and this is one relatively small survey. So you can imagine what digitizing Verilanium uh, is going to be like. Um, and really, we could do with developing some way which will enable the team to share the job um, rather than it being um, one person um, sitting there um, in QGIS <laughs> clicking their way around um, features. So that would be something that we would like to develop if we possibly could. The other big problem I have um, is that uh, at some point we need to come up with a formal archive of the data and the reports uh, and so on. I sort of have in my head what I would like. I'd like a map that you could click on and would get you to the reports and then back down to the raw data and so on. Um, but quite how I get that to happen at the moment, um, I'm not sure. And then just to finish, um, I'd like to say a very big thank you to all my um, volunteers who come out and work on these surveys. Um, it's great fun. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we do have we do have a good time when we're out there, uh, and it does help that um, most sites we find something um, interesting and exciting. Um, so, with a thank you, I'll finish there. Thank you very much.